Okay, it looks like we have a number of people signed in now. So hello everyone. My name is Jean Boutier, a member of the Board of Directors of the Cornwall Conservation Trust here in Cornwall, Connecticut. Thank you all for joining us. And a big thank you to Ben Goldfarb for taking the time to tell us about beavers and why they are so important. Ben's book, Eager, The Surprising Secret Life of Beavers and Why They Matter is both absorbing and witty and well worth the read. Ben is an environmental journalist whose work has appeared in many familiar publications like Audubon Magazine, The Guardian, and Scientific America. He holds a Master of Environmental Management degree from Yale University. His most recent book, Crossings, How Road Ecology is Shaping the Future of Our Planet is available now. If you have questions, please enter them into the chat and Ben will answer as many as time allows after his talk. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce Ben Goldfarb. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Jean, so much uh, for that introduction, for, for having me, and thanks to you all um, for being here uh, this evening, your time, afternoon, my time. I live in uh, Colorado these days, but I am a former Connecticut resident, and I'm uh, really happy to be speaking with you all. Um, so this uh, this afternoon, I'll be, I'll be speaking about this idea of partnering with beavers to heal the planet. You know, how can we work with these uh, amazing creatures uh, to achieve various ecological goals? But before we get into how we can partner with beavers, I think it's important to establish a, a few basic facts about what beavers are and, and how they make their living, because they really are uh, evolutionary marvels in a, a, a lot of ways. So beavers, as you, I'm sure you all know, are rodents. They're North America's largest rodent, you know, typical adult beavers around 50 pounds. So they're quite a bit bigger than uh, many people realize, I think. Uh, and of course, they're semi-aquatic rooms, which means they spend all of their lives more or less uh, in and around the water. Uh, and <clears throat> they have all kinds of fantastic adaptations to fill this unique uh, semi-aquatic niche. Uh, they've got remarkably dense fur, one of the thickest pelts in the animal kingdom, which of course was their undoing, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, they have these wonderful webbed duck-like hind feet. They're really powerful, agile swimmers who can stay underwater for up to 15 minutes, so they're champion breath holders. Uh, they've got a second set of eyelids, transparent eyelids, known as nictitating membranes that function as goggles, uh, as well as a second set of lips, uh, fur-lined lips, like sort of like a valve that can close behind their front teeth so they can chew and drag branches underwater without drowning. I think that's kind of my favorite, uh, coolest beaver feature. Uh, and then what's a beaver's most recognizable, identifiable feature? What makes a beaver a beaver? The tail, of course, and the, the tail is this uh, kind of remarkable multi-purpose appendage. It's a, a rudder while they swim. It's a kickstand out on land. Uh, it's a fat storage device. They actually put on fat for the winter in their tails. Uh, and it's, of course, an alarm system, right? I'm sure that many of you have heard the smack of a beaver's tail uh, hitting the water. And they do that to warn other beavers uh, about the presence of predators. So if you hear that tail slap, uh, you know, at, at, at sundown at a wetland, you know, you're probably the predator that they're they're worried about. And the other wonderful beaver feature that's worth talking about briefly is, is their teeth. Uh, beavers' top and bottom incisors are essentially self-sharpening. They file each other down into these nice chisel-like points. And as you can uh, see in this picture, uh, their beaver's teeth are orange. And the reason they're orange is they're, they're actually uh, chemically and structurally fortified with iron that beavers derive from their foods. So they've got these wonderful uh, iron reinforced teeth, which of course comes in handy when you spend your whole life cutting down trees, right? So beavers uh, fell trees in part to eat the cambium, that's the inner bark, the sugary layer uh, that does the, the growing. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll take just about any deciduous tree. Uh, they do tend to avoid conifers. Their favorite trees are, you know, anything in the poplar family, um, you know, cottonwood, aspen, uh, birch, uh, willow, of course, another uh, favorite beaver food tree, you know, sugar maple. They'll take, again, just about any deciduous tree. Uh, they also eat lots of 
sort of green herbaceous material as well. You know, cattails, water lilies. Uh, you see them mow people's lawns for them sometimes. So they're pretty happy grazers. They're what scientists call choosy generalists. You know, they've got a few species of tree that they prefer. Really, again, anything in that poplar family. But, you know, they're generalists because they will just take, they, they will take just about any any uh, deciduous tree again. Um, they are totally herbivorous, right? They don't eat fish at all. It's a, a, common, uh, a common misconception. So in addition to felling trees to eat that cambium, that inner bark, they also use the wood as construction material. Uh, and there are two basic types of, uh, of beaver structure. Uh, first is the lodge, that's the, the kind of fundamental beaver housing unit that I suspect that uh, most of you have seen. Um, you know, often you see these island lodges out in the middle of a, of a pond. Uh, there are underwater tunnels that lead up into the lodge. Inside the lodge, there's an elevated nesting chamber. Uh, and in there, you've, you've got, uh, you know, typically two to as many as eight or so beavers. And that's generally the, uh, the mated pair, the male and female who mate for life. Uh, and then you've got three year classes of offspring uh, all cohabitating at various times. The kids, the baby beavers, the one-year-olds and the two-year-olds all sharing that lodge. Uh, and then those two-year-olds are the ones who disperse out, um, you know, like heading off to beaver college, looking for their own their own territories. And again, you know, often you see these freestanding island lodges. Uh, you know, sometimes you see these bank attached lodges. That's probably the most common form that they take. Um, and then sometimes, they, you know, they'll just kind of burrow into the bank and, you know, put a few sticks on top as ventilation, essentially. Um, and, you know, these, these sorts of bank burrow type lodges can be pretty inconspicuous. So just because you don't see a big, you know, freestanding island lodge um, it doesn't mean there aren't uh, beavers pretty happily living in that that river bank. Um, and incidentally, that's my dog, uh, Kit, who's named for, of course, a baby beaver. <clears throat> so then in addition to the lodge, you know, the other iconic beaver structure is the dam, right? So why do beavers build dams? What's the point of this unique, bizarre, specialized behavior? <clears throat> well, a beaver out on land uh, is essentially, as one biologist put it to me, a uh, fat, smelly package of meat, right? They just kind of waddle around uh, and they get eaten by all kinds of critters, you know, bears, wolves, uh, cougars, coyotes, any large carnivores, you know, is going to uh, pretty, pretty happily take a beaver. So by building that dam and creating that nice deep pond, uh, you know, they're essentially expanding the extent of their own habitat and shelter, right? Instead of having to walk over land to a good looking aspen tree and risk getting eaten by a, a bear along the way, they can swim to it instead, cut it down, float it back uh, and remain relatively safe. Um, and I think it's important to note that, you know, not all beavers are building dams, right? Beavers very happily live in large bodies of water where there's, where there's already sufficient depth and extent of water that they're safe from predators, right? There are beavers, you know, living very happily uh, in the Connecticut River. Um, and, uh, you know, they don't need, they're not damming it, of course, they're just burrowing into the banks and there's plenty of water for them. Um, you know, really they're building dams on these, you know, these kind of these higher order headwater uh, streams and tributaries, you know, where you really need that dam to have sufficient uh, water depth to survive. <clears throat> So in situations where beavers are building dams, you know, they're typically building one main primary dam uh, and then up to a dozen or so smaller secondary dams. And, you know, these dams come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes. Here's one that I really like near my home in Colorado. Uh, I just love that kind of perfect radial arc. I think that's a really beautiful structure. Uh, you can also see in this picture, they use a lot of rock, uh, which people don't realize. It's not, they're not just sticks. They're using a lot of rock in the foundation as well. Uh, and it's always very adorable to see the beavers carrying the rock in their little front paws waddling on their hind legs. That's a, a cute, a cute thing to see. Uh, you know, sometimes you see these kinds of terrace dams, uh, which basically act as, as locks, essentially, uh, you know, sort of stair-stepping streams and gentling the gradient um, to, you know, make it uh, more amenable habitat. I, I love this sort of terrace-like feature that uh, you see in, in many places. Uh, and, you know, the dams can really be substantial. Here's, uh, you know, one of my favorite dams. This is in Voyagers National Park in Minnesota. Uh, you know, this beaver dam is probably 600 feet long and 15 feet uh, or so high. And it's obviously the work of you know, many successive generations of beavers all adding their stick to the pile. So this, of course, is not a typical dam. Um, this one is uh, pretty gargantuan, but it's the sort of thing that they're capable of, uh, you know, in the, in the right circumstances and when left to their own devices. 
And, you know, I'm always impressed by their, their hydrological savvy, you know, the, the sort of the strategic way in which they build these structures. I often feel like if you took an engineer from the Army Corps and put her on a stream and said, okay, build a dam that minimizes labor and maximizes the total impoundment, you know, she would put the dam uh, exactly where the beavers do. Um, you know, and this is, here's one nice example of that. This is a, a, a pond also in Minnesota, uh, about a 300 acre pond uh, formed by one single beaver dam uh, at the kind of narrow constriction point of the streams. So the beavers built the dam in the most efficient imaginable way uh, to flood this uh, enormous area. So again, I'm always just impressed by their, their hydrological savvy. And then the other, you know, beaver uh, earthwork that we don't really talk about enough um, is their canal digging. You know, in addition to being prolific builders, they're also prolific excavators. And they dig these elaborate networks of canals that extend up and into the forest. Um, and again, that's just a way of, you know, maximizing their own habitat, right? They can swim up those canals, cut down a tree, float it back down to the, lo the, the lodge, um, all without ever really leaving the water. Uh, and that's a really important way that beavers move water across the landscape. Uh, and, you know, you, you often see, uh, you know, lots of amphibian larvae, tadpoles, and, you know, juvenile fish hanging out in these little canals. So this is a, another really important beaver habitat feature, that, uh, those, that, that canal digging function. So, you know, beavers are doing all of this work. They're building dams, creating ponds and wetlands, uh, digging canals, you know, they're doing it all to, uh, to improve their own habitat, right? But in the process, they're also creating habitat for lots of other creatures. You know, beavers are what's known as uh, a keystone species. And in architecture, the keystone is the top block in a stone arch that holds the whole arch together. Uh, and likewise, beavers are holding together aquatic ecosystems, right? Especially in the American West, where I live, you know, wetlands are 2% of total land area, uh, and support around 80% of biodiversity. You know, wetlands are a little more abundant in New England, uh, but they're still precious habitats. And it's, you know, it's really hard to name a, a critter that doesn't benefit from beavers uh, at some point in its in its life cycle. Um, certainly, you know, all kinds of waterfowl and wading birds. Uh, this is a great blue heron rookery uh, in a beaver pond in uh, Wisconsin that I, I visited. Um, even songbirds, you know, passerines uh, are really happy perching, nesting, feeding, and all of the coppiced willows uh, around uh, around a beaver pond. You know, there are a million studies out there that correlate beaver uh, presence with avian diversity. So, you know, I mean, I'm sure many of you are birders, right? And where do you go birding? You go, you go to a wetland, right? Um, so beavers are creating fabulous bird habitat. Uh, they're creating a wonderful habitat for all kinds of other semi-aquatic mammals, moose, muskrat, mink, otter, you know, you, you name it. Um, they create wonderful amphibian habitat, uh, you know, I mean, certainly for leopard frogs and spotted salamanders and all of the, you know, the great uh, wood frogs, uh, all of the amphibians you, you guys have uh, in, in New England. Um, this is the boreal toad. That's a, that's a kind of a very rare uh, toad that we have in Colorado. Um, and about 90% of the boreal toad's breeding habitat is beaver ponds. Uh, so this is, you know, this, this animal is basically an obligate beaver pond breeder. Um, which is which is kind of a, a cool a cool connection. Uh, even insects, you know, are also beaver beneficiaries. This is the St. Francis satyr. Uh, it's the rarest butterfly in North America, uh, and its caterpillars feed almost exclusively on sedges that grow in beaver wetlands. So the destruction of the beaver, which we'll talk about momentarily, uh, you know, was also this kind of cataclysmic event for the St. Francis satyr, right? So here's a, a you know, a, a butterfly that's essentially a, a beaver specialist, uh, which is kind of mind blowing to think about. Uh, and then there are just some, some cooler connections worth worth highlighting um, for uh, for a moment. This is uh, just a really cool anecdote. Um, this was in in Minnesota uh, where I visited a couple of years ago, and and this was an, an old beaver pond site. Um, you can see the the uh, the beaver dam, uh, you know, in the back of this in the in the kind of the back half of the screen. Um, so in this situation, you know, the beavers left for whatever reason. Uh, the dam broke down. The pond drained. So you get this nice rich wet meadow that's really good forage for uh you know moose and deer and other other animals uh, but in this case you know this giant beaver lodge was left high and dry after that pond drained and here a pack of wolves actually moved into the lodge and raised their pups in the lodge so that's beavers creating habitat for their direct predator i think that's uh pretty mind-blowing to think about um, and then one other really neat 
beaver observation. Uh, last year, I was in Utah visiting some beaver ponds with a friend, uh, and we saw a sandhill crane walking uh, along the crest of a beaver dam. I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. I've never seen a, a sandhill crane in a beaver pond before. So I took a picture, and then later, I was looking at the picture and zoomed in on the crane's feet and saw that the crane had actually built a nest and laid a clutch of two eggs uh, on the crest of that beaver dam, which basically acts as sort of this island out in the middle of this pond, uh, you know, safe from coyotes and foxes and other other predators. Um, so again, you know, there's, there's always some kind of cool ecological connection to observe uh, at a, a beaver complex, always something, something neat to see. Uh, and then, you know, another really important beaver beneficiary um, that's really driving a lot of interest in beavers right now are fish. Uh, you know, if you're a juvenile rainbow trout like this guy or a brook trout in New England uh, or a cutthroat trout in Colorado where, where I live, you know, you don't want to live in <clears throat> the main stem, fast flowing, uh, you know, free moving river. You want to live in a, an eddy or a side channel or a meander or a deep pool, uh, you know, where you can kind of hang out and save your strength and hide from, uh, you know, kingfishers and great blue herons, right? You want that complex slow water refuge habitat, uh, which is exactly what beavers create. So there are lots and lots of studies connecting beavers with fish production because they create such good rearing habitat um, for, for juvenile fish. Now, one common objection that you hear from anglers and sometimes uh, from fish biologists is, you know, wait a second, we're trying to take dams out of streams right now, right, to improve fish migration. We do, we're not trying to put more dams into streams. Um, but of course, you know, a, a beaver dam is nothing like uh, a big human built concrete dam. And, you know, fish have uh, a million clever ways of getting past beaver dams. They can go around them during periods of high flow. I've seen them wriggle through the, the woody structure and just kind of slide their way up. Uh, they jump over them. Um, you know, there have been studies showing individual salmon uh, passing more than 200 beaver dams on their way to spawn. Uh, here's, uh, you know, just kind of one, again, another another cool anecdote. This is just outside of Seattle, a uh, beaver pond that I visited. Uh, and in the top right corner of the screen, you know, here's the beaver dam, right? Here's the, the upstream pond. Uh, and here are the two freshly excavated coho salmon nests. So at least two fish had no problem whatsoever surmounting that uh, that beaver dam and uh, and successfully spawning. And in fact, you know the evolutionary connection between beavers and fish uh, is so deep that it uh, it furnished the uh, the the slogan for my favorite bumper sticker, uh, which is that beavers taught salmon to jump. Right? I think that gets at the the connection pretty nicely between these two these two critters. So today, you know, we don't know exactly how many beavers live in North America, uh, probably something like 10 to 15 million, right? So they're not an endangered species. Uh, you know, they're not going extinct anytime soon. That sounds like a lot of beavers. But then you start to ask yourself, well, wait a second, how many beavers did North America used to have? How many beavers lived here prior to European arrival? Uh, and again, you know, we don't really know the answer, um, but you know, the best estimate we have suggests that there are as many as 400 million beavers uh, on this, this continent uh, when, when Europeans arrived. And you know, all of those beavers would have built um, between 150 and 250 million uh, beaver ponds, uh, which a little bit of, you know, back of the envelope math suggests that maybe they impounded 230,000 square miles uh, of water, um, which, you know, for reference, is about the size of uh, Arizona and Nevada put together. So just a huge amount of this continent was historically underwater, uh, thanks to beavers. And there's no question it was a much greener, bluer, wetter, lusher place. And, you know, this idea that beavers are keystone species and ecosystem engineers, you know, is something that native people uh, understood, um, certainly for thousands of years. Um, you know, in, in fact, many tribes like the Blackfeet in Montana had cultural prohibitions against killing beavers because they recognized that, you know, particularly in the American West, uh, you know, beavers created these ecological oases that were uh, incredible, incredible watering holes for deer and bison and elk and all kinds of uh, important game species. Um, so beavers were revered by many tribes. And, you know, the, the idea that beavers, again, are, you know, valuable animals to have on the landscape is not something that's, uh, you know, new to Western science, right? We're just, we're sort of relearning what native people have known for a very long time. 
so one of the things that I tried to do, you know, working on uh, Eager, my, my book about beavers, was sort of reconstruct what a fully beavered North America looked like and what it functioned like. You know, what was this continent before we wiped out all of those beavers? Uh, and, you know, I, I, so I you know, looked through old trappers journals and explorers diaries and railroad survey reports. And, you know, they're just in, incredible accounts uh, of beaver abundance, you know, explorers crossing uh, what is today Indiana and, and not finding a dry place to camp for 100 miles because beavers had so thoroughly ponded everything up. Uh, you know, Lewis and Clark were fabulous beaver observers and naturalists. And, you know, going up the Missouri River, they described seeing beaver dams in every tributary as far as the eye can see uh, up to the base of the mountain. So these were just, you know, mind-blowingly abundant, ubiquitous, prolific animals uh, historically. So that was in 1805 that Lewis and Clark described seeing beaver dams in every tributary as far as the eye could see. In 1843, just 38 years later, John James Audubon, of course, the naturalist and painter, traveled the exact same route going up the Missouri River. And he was looking for he was looking for beavers to paint. He was kind of he kind of moved on from birds. He was on this mammal kick. He was trying to find some beavers in the Missouri River, and he couldn't find a single beaver uh, in the Missouri River where they'd been again, unavoidable, uh, just 38 years earlier. So, you know, what happened to beavers in less than four decades? Where did all of those beavers go? What did they turn into? Well, of course, they turned into hats, right? Uh, you know, sometimes we think of the, we think of the phrase beaver hat, and we, we picture like a big fluffy uh, Davy Crockett type of thing. But in fact, uh, beaver hats we were these elegant Victorian style top hats that were all the rage back in uh, in Europe. Uh, and, you know, really beavers along with timber and cod and gold, you know, were the most important uh, economic resources that uh, the European uh, colonists found in the, the quote unquote new world. You know, the fur trade really begins, uh, you know, in, in New England in the early 1600s uh, and very rapidly spreads west and south across the continent. Uh, you know, white fur trappers and traders extracting beavers from every single river, lake, stream, and, and pond uh, they encountered. And it's, you know, it's really hard, again, to overstate the historic significance of the, the fur trade and just what a, a, an important event this really was in, in early American history. You know, practically every um, significant event prior to the Civil War has some kind of beaver connection. You know, it was... Uh, you know, beavers that helped fuel the Louisiana Purchase by, you know, offering trapping grounds uh, that, uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson wanted to acquire. You know, beavers helped start the American Revolution, uh, you know, insofar as the British denying uh, the colonists access to trapping grounds west of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, that was one of the offenses that angered the colonists and helped inspire them to revolt. You know, it was those uh, fur trappers and traders who spread smallpox and other diseases that ravaged uh, many native tribes. So, you know, the history of the fur trade uh, is really the history of, of uh, early America and all of its kind of grandeur and, and folly. Um, here's just one kind of amazing testament, I think, to the historic significance of these animals. This is a coin minted by the Oregon Territory. So the Oregon Territory historically encompassed everything from Wyoming to the Pacific Ocean, the entirety of, of, uh, you know, the, of the North Northwest and inland Northwest. Uh, and the Oregon Territory in 1849 minted these beaver coins. Um, and the value of one beaver coin was fixed to the value of one beaver pelt. So the entire economy uh, of, you know, 25 percent of the country uh, was was uh, operated under the pelt standard, essentially, which, again, is just uh, really just an amazing testament to how abundant these animals were and, and how uh, how important they were. So in addition to being this enormously uh, significant historical event, the fur trade was also a profound uh, ecological event, even a geological event. Uh, you know, of course, what happens when you trap out 400 million beavers? Well, all of those beaver dams break down and all of those ponds drain. You know, one amazing testament uh, to, again, what a, a, a dramatic, uh, really geological event the loss of beavers was, um, is that so in the early 1600s, uh, you know, so many beaver ponds broke down and drained to the ocean that they fertilized uh, an enormous algae bloom uh, or kind of a diatom bloom, a phytoplankton bloom, 
uh, in the in the Long Island Sound. Uh, and you know, then all of those diatoms basically settled out. So today, if you take a, a sediment core in the Long Island Sound, you'll see this layer of phytoplankton that was fertilized by all of the nutrients uh, flowing out of out of broken beaver ponds uh, in the early 1600s. So the signature of the of the floor of the the fur trade is written in the floor of the ocean. I think that's just again an, an amazing testament um, to what a, a profound event this really was. Uh, and you know, it, it really was an ecological disaster in a lot of ways. You know, we don't really, we don't really think about the fur trade as we in the same terms as we think about the deforestation of uh, New England or the busting of the sod in the Midwest or gold mining in the Sierra Nevada, right? We don't think about beaver trapping as being this seminal ecological disaster, but you know, in many ways, it was the original sin, right? Uh, you know, and you've got. So when you know when you when you have a healthy beaver rich stream, all of those beaver dams act like speed bumps, right? They slow water down and spread water out. And when you lose all of those beaver built speed bumps, there's nothing checking the velocity of water. You get in many cases this catastrophic uh, incision and erosion and this disconnection between the stream uh, and the the floodplain, right? So this this stream is now trapped within its banks and it can no longer spill onto the floodplain to create all of those lush wetlands and wet meadows that we care about. And again, you know, there are thousands of miles of stream uh, that look like this all over North America. And, you know, I think that we often see this sort of erosion and degradation and say, well, that was, you know, probably, uh, you know, due to overgrazing or mining or some other historic impact. But in, in, in so many cases, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, it was the, the loss of beavers that caused this sort of thing. So you know, by 1900 or so, we start to we start to wise up and to realize that uh, you know, as Enos Mills put it, great naturalist, live beavers are more valuable than dead ones. And all over the country, uh, you know, the beaver populations are at their nadir. You know, these animals are functionally extinct uh, in the lower 48. But you know, states begin to reintroduce beavers. Uh, you know, most of Connecticut's beavers come from uh, New York. Actually, that was there was a the big beaver reintroduction in the Adirondacks uh, in 1906. Uh, and, you know, those beavers reproduced rapidly and sort of uh, propagated all over all over New England. Um, so, you know, most of the beavers in the Northeast are all the descendants of this New York reintroduction. Probably the most famous beaver reintroduction happened in uh, Idaho in the 1940s, 1948. Uh, you know, the, the state of Idaho was trying to Kind of repopulate beavers in uh, in this wilderness area. Um, at first, they tried moving the beavers on horseback. The horses didn't take very kindly to that, as you'd imagine. Um, so then they, had, you know, one of the one of these biologists had the bright idea of stuffing beavers in crates uh, and tossing them out of airplanes. It was, you know, it's 1948. Uh, it's just post World War II. There are all of these surplus uh, parachutes lying around, um, and uh, they just start uh, chucking beavers. Um, so in, uh, in 1948, they, they airdropped 76 beavers uh, into the Idaho wilds. 75 of the beavers survived. One, unfortunately, uh, fell to his death. Very sad. Uh, but well, you know, when they flew back over this area uh, just a, a year later, they found ponds and wetlands and all the places where they had airdropped beavers. So this was incredibly successful at the time. Uh, you know, nobody's throwing beavers out of airplanes anymore, but that's how it was done uh, for a while in the, in the 1940s. So, you know, all throughout the, the 20th century, you know, beaver populations are recovering from the industrial fur trade uh, and they're they're moving back into their former haunts uh, only to discover that we've colonized all of that habitat in their absence. Right. It turns out that, you know, good beaver habitat and good human habitat are, are one and the same. You know, we both like low gradient stream corridors and broad fertile floodplains. You know, that's where we put all of our infrastructure and that's where they build their dams. And, you know, I'd argue that we're the, the nuisance species more than they are. Um, but, you know, certainly conflicts can arise when beavers and humans uh, overlap. And, you know, here's a set of railroad tracks that I visited in Massachusetts uh, that beavers uh, had very, very thoroughly flooded. Um, and, you know, it was this big uh, sort of economic disaster for the railroad. Uh, <clears throat> here's a, another example of beaver-human conflict. This is in New Mexico. Um, this is a little cabin that I came across one day that, as you can see, beavers had totally flooded. Uh, and here, this is just kind of a cool picture, I think, because in this case, the beavers begin their dam in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. They dam up to the base of the cabin, then they incorporate the cabin in their dam, and they keep going on the right hand side of the screen right so they'll just use whatever you give them and you know i wouldn't want to be this landowner obviously but you have to admire uh the ingenuity of the critters in uh, in this this instance 
Uh, another very frequent beaver conflict is damming and road culverts, right? If you're a beaver, you know, the, the roadbed is basically the world's greatest dam and the culvert is the leak in the dam. And, you know, beavers plug leaks. That's that's what they do. And, you know, the water level rises, the road washes out, uh, you know, very expensive and time consuming to maintain. Uh, so that's probably the most common beaver conflict, but, it, you know, they get into all kinds of uh, interesting, bizarre mischief. Uh, this is a, a beaver that uh, broke into a dollar store in Maryland and was browsing the uh, plastic Christmas tree rack when it was apprehended by the authorities. So they get into all kinds of uh, interesting trouble. Uh, and, you know, the way that we almost always handle those conflicts is by killing the offending beaver. Right. And that, you know, that makes a, a certain amount of intuitive sense. You know, the beaver's causing a problem. Get the beaver out of there. You know, the federal government, the Department of Agriculture kills uh, around 20,000 beavers every year. Private private nuisance trappers uh, kill certainly many tens or possibly hundreds of thousands more. You know, we don't we don't really know. Uh, and, you know, I think that's problematic on a number of levels. I mean, first, of course, you know, when you eliminate the beavers, you're also eliminating the potential for that great pond and wetland habitat that they create. Um, but, you know, also when you kill the beavers, you all you're doing is putting up a vacancy sign for the next family of beavers, right? As long as that culvert is still there beckoning to them, they're always going to come back. And, you know, those problems are always going to recur. So you start to wonder, you know, what, um, you know, are there better ways of dealing with these problems? You know, what can we do about our beaver conflicts rather than just, you know, trapping them uh, ad infinitum? And, you know, certainly one option is live trapping and relocating them. Uh, this is a typical beaver live trap. Um, and, you know, that's that's uh, that can be an effective technique. Um, you know, it's not it's not legal in every state. I'm not sure if it's legal in Connecticut or not. I, I need to look that up. Um, you know, I mean, certainly in Colorado, where I live, you know, we, we do we do lots of beaver relocation. Uh, and, you know, the, the problem with um, so, you know, here's Sandy and Chopper. These are a couple of beavers being relocated to a, a new home uh, in uh, in northern Washington. Um, but, you know, the, the problem with beaver relocation is, is that first, you know, you're not really solving the conflict. Right. You're just, again, putting up that vacancy sign for the next beaver family to show up. Uh, but, you know, also it's it's not all that effective. You know, those those beavers often get eaten or they you know, they 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 don't survive for other reasons or they move on. Uh, it's just you know, it's just not the best way of dealing with these conflicts. It's you know, it's one option, um, but I think it's it's preferable preferable to solve conflicts non-lethally and on site and let those beavers stick around and coexist with these animals, uh, you know, rather than either killing or moving them. So how do we coexist with beavers? Well, you know, lots of one, one frequent beaver conflict that, that uh, many beavers are killed for every year is cutting down trees, right? Uh, you know, ornamental trees, fruit trees, you, you name it. And I, I just don't think that any beaver should ever be killed uh, for the sin of cutting down a tree. That's just, you know, too easy a problem to solve. And here's just one cool case study. This is in uh, actually in Salida, Colorado, uh, my, my current uh, residence. Um, and in this instance, you know, a local land trust had these beautiful old cottonwood trees they wanted to protect. OK, that's fine. So they fenced off those old cottonwoods and then they left unfenced the non-native Siberian elm trees and the beavers took took those down. So that's invasive vegetation management using a beaver as your agent. I think that's uh, just a cool example of, of creative thinking. Uh, another option for tree conflict is actually painting the trees um, with uh, kind of an abrasive latex paint that they don't like chewing on. Um, I, li I like this. This is uh, somewhere in Tennessee. I, I like this example um, because uh, they just did you know such a beautiful, colorful job. You don't often see that, but uh, this is uh, kind of a cool, um, yeah, cool, uh, beautiful way of uh, beaver proofing your, uh, your the trees you're trying to protect. Um, and I also like I also like this this study too, I think this is in Chattanooga, um, and their first attempt before putting the paint on the trees was actually putting hot sauce on the trees, um, which uh, the, the rain washed away. Uh, and that's just a very, that's just very Southern, you know, I feel like that's a, that's a good Southern solution, um, trying hot sauce, but you know, the, that's not recommended, but the paint is definitely recommended. You know, flooding conflicts are uh, more difficult than tree protection, but you know, there too, we've got some great options. This is a contraption called the Beaver Deceiver with its inventor, Skip Lyle. And the Beaver Deceiver is basically, you know, it's a pretty simple uh, operation. It's basically a pipe um, that, you know, drains pond level, the kind of the wire fencing is there to keep beavers from plugging up the pipe. Um, and, you know, all you're doing is you're just creating a leak, right? You're passing that pipe through the beaver dam or into the road culvert, and you're just moving water from the upstream side to the downstream side, 
dropping the level of the uh, of the pond, uh, you know, ideally to a point that both humans and beavers can tolerate. Uh, here's a you know a pretty low tech version that uh, I, I helped install a couple of years ago. Um, Skip Lyle would not approve of this. It's it's you know not uh, sufficiently engineered to his taste, I think. Um, but you know it's, it illustrates the basic principle, right? You're just again you're you're draining that pond to a point where both humans and beavers uh, can put up with it. And you know this we we put this in. Two years ago, and you know, today the uh, the landowner whose property was flooded, uh, her property is no longer flooded, and the beavers are still present, uh, and everybody's uh, pretty pretty happy. Uh, so you know these these sorts of uh, solutions, you know these these non lethal flow device uh, flood mitigation systems have been shown to be have been shown to be you know eighty seven to ninety seven percent percent effective when they've been studied right so maybe not every single conflict uh, can be solved with one of these but you know there's no question that there are thousands of places all over the country where we, where where we're currently engaged in these very you know again expensive inhumane time consuming cycles of beaver trapping and recolonization and trapping and recolonization, where we could be doing this sort of thing uh, and living with these animals in, instead, of, uh, instead of removing them. So why is it important that we coexist with beavers, you know, besides their sort of in inherent value, um, you know, and their, their ability to create wildlife habitat? Well, you know, they also, they also provide all kinds of ecological benefits and services for us humans, right? And not that that's the most important, uh, you know, measure of an animal, but, you know, certainly it's a good argument to be able to make, right? That, hey, this is a species that profoundly benefits our own species in all kinds of uh, different ways. Um, so, you know, a few key beaver ecosystem services uh, that make these animals so valuable. You know, so first, especially, you know, in the, in the West where it's so hot and dry, of course, or dry, especially, um, you know, they're fantastic drought mitigators, right? Uh, you know, they store lots of water. They create lots of little reservoirs. You know, here's a good example of this uh, in, in Colorado. You know, this, this, this stream, this is the headwaters of the Roaring Fork River. Uh, you know, you can see the stream is just this little sinuous thread. And then it hits all of these linear features, right? These beaver dams and all of that water is being stored uh, in this valley and it's spreading out laterally onto the floodplain and it's soaking into the ground and recharging aquifers, right? There's five to 10 times as much groundwater storage uh, at a beaver pond as surface water storage, right? So these, so these animals are, again, they're amazing animals of water storage. And that's, you know, that's so important, uh, you know, as we enter climate change, or as we're in the midst of the throes of climate change, uh, right, you know, we're, we're losing our winters in a lot of ways. We're losing our snowpack. All of that precipitation is falling as rain rather than snow, and it's running off the landscape right away. So we need a way to slow that water down and keep it up in our headwaters, and beavers do that for us, you know, by building all of these, these little reservoirs. You know, more relevant to New England is that they're also fantastic agents of flood control, right? And, and that's a little bit counterintuitive. You know, we think about beavers as causing floods rather than stopping them. But, you know, you get a big pulse of uh, stormwater racing downstream and then it hits all of those beaver ponds and wetlands. And it, again, it spreads out onto the floodplain. It soaks into the ground. It's captured in the pond itself. You know, there have been studies uh, showing that something like 30% of major rainfall events can be captured by, by beavers. That's a lot of flood protection. And this is actually uh, a beaver pond uh, in Scotland, uh, of course, a very rainy place where beavers have been reintroduced primarily for their, their flood control benefits. And I think it's worth just, you know, taking a second to ponder how miraculous that is, right? We've got, you know, two polar opposite problems, drought uh, in the West, flooding on the East, uh, and beavers are helping us helping us address both of them by you know, sort of stabilizing that unstable hydrograph and, uh, you know, just keeping water on the landscape. So beavers, pretty, pretty magical, you know. Uh, beavers are also fantastic irrigators, right? They're, again, they're spreading water out and they're sinking into the ground. They're raising water tables. Uh, and, you know, they've, they've, as a result, been embraced by many farmers and ranchers. This is a, a rancher I met in Nevada, James Rogers, uh, who made the point that, you know, beavers, by, again, irrigating his pastures for him, uh, were basically increasing uh, forage production for his livestock tenfold, right? So now there's this, you know, wonderful cluster of beaver-loving ranchers, uh, you know, in northeast Nevada, one of the most conservative places in the country, um, you know, because they've seen the ability of these animals to, you know, 
improve their uh, their their productivity. Um, so that's that's one really exciting thing about this beaver movement. Uh, you know, is that it's not just uh, environmentalists. You know, there are also lots of lots of uh, you know farmers and ranchers as well who are part of this because again they just recognize how how crit how critical these critters are. Beavers are wonderful agents of pollution filtration, right? You get, you know, a stream racing along, it's carrying nitrates, phosphates, heavy metals, you know, herbicides, pesticides, all that crap, you know, and and, uh, and then that stream hits the pond, slows down, loses its energy and drops all of that stuff that it's carrying in the water column, which gets entrained uh, beneath many subsequent layers of sediment and is basically captured in that in that pond. There have been studies showing that beavers are capable of capturing 40% of the nitrates currently entering the Long Island Sound uh, and causing dead zones to form uh, every every summer. So these, these animals are just amazing. Again, amazing uh, pollution filterers. And they're also great carbon sequesterers as well, right? All of that rich organic matter that gets, you know, captured in these ponds is sequestering enormous amounts of carbon. And there have been studies suggesting that, you know, that uh, you get the same uh, carbon capture in a beaver complex as you would get in an equivalent area of old growth forest, right? So these animals are, again, they're just kind of catching everything we, we throw at them. And then the final wonderful beaver service is that they're they're incredible firefighters. You know, water doesn't burn. And by spreading water out across the landscape, they're creating these wonderful fire breaks and fire refugia. Uh, you know, here's a, a beautiful illustration of that from the Sharps fire uh, in Idaho a few years ago, where, you know, you can see that all of the uplands have been burnt to a crisp. And the last green, wet, blue, lush place on the landscape is that you know, beaver created valley bottom, right? And they're actually researchers who propose that the US Forest Service change its mascot from smoky bear to smoky beaver, right? An animal that unlike bears actually fights fires. So given all of these wonderful uh, services and benefits, you know, why do we still kill so many beavers? Why are these animals still so persecuted? And I, you know, I think, I think what it comes down to is that when we annihilated several hundred million beavers, you know, we changed North American landscapes in fundamental ways that we don't fully recognize. You know, and we, we internalized this idea of a healthy stream being this free flowing, fast moving, rocky bottom, single thread channel. When in reality, you know, so many of our aquatic systems looked more like this one, right? Uh, you know, water's spread out all over, all over the place and it's kind of seemingly stagnant and there are, you know, dead and dying trees everywhere and the whole thing smells like decomposition and the bottom is kind of mucky. Uh, you know, this is not necessarily the kind of stream you would see uh, in, you know, in a fly fishing magazine. But you know, historically, this sort of, of ecosystem was likely more rule than exception in many places, thanks again to, to, to beavers. So if we're going to fully embrace these animals, uh, you know, we have to reconfigure our historical imagination and you know, internalize a different idea of what a healthy stream should look like. So to sum it all up, you know, we have this amazing animal. Uh, it provides all of these wonderful ecosystem services. Uh, it does it all for free. And best of all, it doesn't need permits. That's really nice too, right? So it's, you know, as the mantra of the beaver believer goes, it's time that we get out of the way and uh, let the rodent do the work. I think that gets, gets nicely at, uh, you know, what our, our mission should be here. Um, I will add briefly uh, that uh, as Jean mentioned, I do have a, a new book out as well. Um, crossings, which is uh, about the science of road ecology. That's basically the field of study that looks at how our infrastructure shapes nature and, you know, what we can do to mitigate the negative effects of, uh, of our, our roads. Um, that's, uh, again, that just came out last month from uh, W.W. Norton um, and is available everywhere that books are sold. Um, but, you know, we're here to talk about beavers. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll very happily uh, take some questions. Um, if you guys want to uh, pop them in the chat. So I'll say thanks so much and uh, we can move into the, the Q&A phase. Let's see, so uh, uh, a couple of questions um, that uh, I saw in the chat there. Um, let's see, Stella uh, asked in a direct message, how far away do the two-year-olds uh, move when they when they disperse? Those, you know, those, so those are kind of the teenage beavers, right? Who leave their home lodge and go out onto the landscape looking for their own territories. And, you know, really um, the, uh, you know, it, it, just, it just depends on how dense the local beaver population is, right? These are very territorial animals, you know, and they don't like having 
unrelated beavers show up in their territories and they will fight um, with each other, sometimes to the to the death. Um, so those, you know, those dispersing two year old, I mean, they just got to keep moving until they can find uh, a territory that's not occupied. Um, so, you know, in, in situations where there aren't a lot of beavers, you know, maybe they'll just go, you know, half a mile downstream. Uh, and find their own spot. But, you know, in situations where there are lots of beavers, they have to travel a really long way. And I actually talked to uh, a beaver trapper in uh, in Minnesota uh, once who he he caught a he caught a young beaver, uh, put ear tags in it, let it go. Uh, and then uh, another trapper caught the same beaver 140 miles away. Um, because again, Minnesota is just a place with a lot of beavers, and that beaver had to travel a really long way downstream uh, looking for its own territory. So it's a good question, Stella, and the answer is it just depends on the situation. Uh, let's see, Catherine um, said that uh, she saw a drawing of a section of a lodge that showed all the species that actually live inside. Um, I can't find it again, but it showed amphibians, mice, and others. Uh, can you expound on this? Yeah, it's a it's a, a great a great question. Certainly, other animals um, do cohabitate in beaver lodges sometimes. You know, I think that the most the most um, common animal that you see living with beavers are muskrats. Uh, you know, I think that I mean probably you know half the beaver lodges I've I've seen have a, a family of muskrats living in there uh, as as well. And and um, you know, in, in it's hard to say. I mean, in some cases, it looks like they are using the same entrances as beaver as beavers, and presumably the same main chamber. In other situations, it seems like they're they're kind of building their own little separate chamber, and they're coming and going from a different entrance uh, as the beavers. Um, but you very often see muskrats uh, living in the in the lodge. Um, I think one misconception sometimes that you hear is that otters also cohabitate in the lodge, and, and that's actually uh, not true. You know, otters love beavers because beavers create great fish ponds, but uh, beavers tend not to like having otters around um, because otters do occasionally uh, predate uh, beaver kits. So you don't, you, you see muskrats in beaver lodges, but not, uh, not otters. Let's see, Dolores uh, said, can you tell us more about the cost and fad for beaver hats? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the beaver hat fad, um, you know, again, I mean, it, it really, uh, you know, extended from, you know, I mean, it, it began in Europe, you know, Europe has its own species of beaver, the Eurasian beaver, um, which were, you know, trapped out both for their pelts and also for their caster sacs, their little um, scent glands, essentially, uh, which uh, were considered to have medicinal value. Um, so, you know, so the hat, I mean, the beaver hat thing really begins in Europe with the sort of with Eurasian beavers, then, you know, those are extirpated. Uh, and then, uh, you know, and then when when colonists arrive in North America, you know, they find this new source of beavers uh, to create these hats. And, you know, the reason that beavers were the preferred hat making material, um, really above all other species, is that beavers have two layers of fur. Uh, they've got the long, coarse outer guard hairs, and they have a second layer of under fur, um, which trappers call the beaver wool. Uh, and uh, basically, if you looked at those under hairs under a microscope, you'd see that they all have they have little hooks or barbs at the ends. So when you felt them up, they all of those little hooks act like Velcro uh, and create this really durable, malleable uh, hat making material um, that was, you know, again, just made these, you know, made these hats that were, uh, you know, were all all the all the rage. And, and so that, that, you know, that that fad lasted until, you know, the 1840s or so. And then uh, silk really replaced beaver fur. And there's actually a lot of debate among historians about whether, you know, people stopped trapping beavers because silk replaced fur as the, the sort of the um, material of choice or whether, you know, we ran out of beavers uh, and then hat makers had to look to China um, for silk. And I think it's the latter. I think, you know, we basically wiped out these animals um, and uh, had to look had to look elsewhere. And then silk became the the, the hat, the hat of choice. Uh, Richard Walkowitz, I believe of the Hastings Walkowitzes, um, said, uh, is there an estimate of the maximum number of beavers that could be accommodated? Um, considering how much of the potential habitat is now occupied by humans, yeah, that's a that's a that is a really good question, right? How many, you know? So so let's say we, you know, if we used to have four hundred million beavers, how many million beavers can we uh, have today? You know, because as as uh, Richard points out, you know, we've we have taken up most of the most of the available habitat, right? And and you're right that you know we can't get back to 
400 million. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard beaver biologists estimate um, that, you know, we could get to 40 or 50 percent um, of historic capacity given, uh, you know, given the available opportunity. And, you know, today we're in most places, we're probably at 10 percent. Um, you know, New England definitely has a higher uh is is closer to carrying capacity than than uh, western western states are so you know places like i mean you know I'd, I'd say that much of you know much of connecticut and vermont and you know the catskills and adirondacks you know might be approaching capacity uh at, at least you know given how little habitat uh, remains for for wild animals um whereas you know here in colorado i bet we're at you know five or ten percent um of of capacity and you know we could get to let's say 50 um so Let's see, uh, Jonathan asked, um, what persuades beavers to abandon one location and set up shop in another? Uh, yeah, it's a, you know, it's a really good question. Um, why do beavers move on? Um, you know, I think that often when beavers seem to have abruptly left an area, they've either been uh, predated by some predator um, or they've died of disease. You know, we, we actually don't know a ton about beaver disease dynamics, um, but hularemia is the, the main disease that they, they get. And that can just, you know, run through a watershed and wipe out 90% of the beavers uh, in, a, in a year. And again, you know, we don't know how often that occurs, but my suspicion is that, you know, when beavers seem to have left, you know, they've, they've, there's been a little, you know, beaver epidemic um, that we don't actually know about. Um, you know, it's, I mean, one, I think that one misconception is that they eat themselves out of house and home, right? They'll just, they'll just deplete the food supply and have to move on. And I, I don't really think that happens because they're such good irrigators. You know, they're essentially growing their own food supply. Um, you know, they're basically acting as rotational grazers, right? They're eating the, you know, one year they eat the food on the north side of the pond. Um, and, you know, meanwhile, they're, all of their, their irrigation is sort of creating the food supply on the south side. And then they'll, they'll just kind of go between pasture to, you know, pasture to pasture over the course of years. Um, and uh, again, you know, because they're just, you know, they're just such good irrigators. I, you know, I think they're basically um, never really at risk of, of uh, depleting their own, their own food. Um, one thing that does happen is that ponds silt in over time. Uh, you know, all of that sediment deposition, um, you know, can cause a pond to fill up. And, you know, they definitely do some excavating and raise the height of the dam uh, to keep up with that. But, you know, I do think that once in a while, um, a pond will just fill in faster than they, uh, you know, really want to keep it open. And, and uh, you know, it'll just turn into a wet meadow and then they'll, then they'll move on. Uh, let's see, Jane asked, can you explain more about the, uh, the composition of a beaver's tail? Um, no fur, and do male and females have the same tails? Yes, they do. Uh, the tail is, um, it's all fat, basically. There's one bone that runs through the middle of it, the rest of it is fat, um, and, uh, and then the scaly outer part is actually keratin, you know, the same stuff in our, our, our fingernails, uh, and that was, um, you know, sort of historically considered the, you know, the, the most delectable part of the beaver, you know, all of those, those beaver trappers, uh, you know, in the, in the 19th century, they would just, you know, cut off the beaver tails, put them on an open, put them on a spit over an open flame. Um, and then, you know, the, 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 the scaly outer part just kind of blisters and sloughs off and you get this like dripping hunk of, uh, of fat. That was sort of like the, the highest delicacy for a, a mountain man in 1830. Uh, Phyllis asked, uh, they eat anything but bark? Yeah, you know, as I mentioned, they eat lots of the sort of green herbaceous stuff. You know, they'll eat the forbs, you know, wildflowers, grasses, uh, you know, cattails. They dig up lots of aquatic vegetation, you know, all of like those roots, um, those kind of like rhizomal stuff at the bottom of the pond. They'll, they'll excavate that and eat that. So, they, you know, they'll, I mean, they'll just take, they eat just about any, any kind of, you know, uh, vegetation, um, essentially, especially in summer, you know, in, in summer, I think that they're probably eating more green herbaceous vegetation than they're actually eating bark. You know, the bark is really, um, you know, I mean, they're, I mean, they're eating it year round, but, you know, it's especially important in winter, uh, you know, when they cut a bunch of branches and fall and they assemble a food cache and then they have that, you know, that, that bark, that cambium resource, you know, in their food cache at the bottom of the pond all winter long. Um, and then in summer, you know, I think they, they often shift to the kind of the green uh, herbaceous stuff. Uh, Darcy asked, with large changes in population historically, is there any evidence of a change in a beaver's average size, disease, 
uh, common illness in their evolution. Uh, yeah, not to not to my knowledge, I'm not sure if anybody's ever really looked at that. Um, but it's a it's, those are good questions. You know what what happened when uh, you know beavers passed through this little population bottleneck? I don't I don't, I don't really know. Um, so Darcy, you've identified a good project for a, a master student potentially. Um, let's see. Douglas said, "Does anybody does everybody know that uh, that Danbury is a major producer of beaver hats?" Um, yes, certainly a famous, famous spot, um, you know, famously uh, mercury polluted spot, right? You know, mercury was sort of an integral part of the hat making uh, process. That's where, and that's where the phrase mad as, mad as a hatter comes from, as you probably know, is from, you know, all the mercury poisoning that uh, hatters would get. And, uh, you know, Danbury uh, was basically an epicenter of, uh, of mercury pollution, um, at, thanks to, uh, thanks to its role in the, in the hat, the hat industry. Um, so yeah, Danbury has kind of a sorted, sorted hat history. Um, Stella asked, uh, how do they move big logs on land to get them to the water? Uh, sometimes it's, they seem to move them a long way to water. Um, and yeah, you're, you're right about that, Stella. They can, they can move those big logs a very long way. Uh, you know, often what they do is, uh, they'll actually, they'll actually, they'll section the, the tree up, you know, they'll fell a tree and then they'll cut that, uh, that trunk into a bunch of different more movable sections, um, which they can uh, drag around more more readily, and they're just you know they're just really strong animals. You know, I mean, for for a fifty pound rodent, you know, they just they're just really. I'm always impressed, yeah, by the size of the material they can just they can just drag. Um, it's really uh, they're they're pretty remarkable. They're just these you know big hunks of muscle that uh, lug some some pretty large material around. Um, so with that, I'll say it looks like we're we're basically uh, at, at an hour, and I don't see any more questions in the chat. So, um, oh, and Kathleen asked, do you have any photos of beavers moving rocks? Um, I don't know. I'm not sure that I have any photos, but certainly if you you know if you just if you I, I know there's some good YouTube videos out there of, of beavers moving rocks. So just hop on YouTube and like type beavers carrying rocks into the search bar, and and I, I think some adorable stuff um, will come up. Um, and then Anna asked, I read once that beavers can run 40 miles an hour on land. Is that true? I don't think so. That sounds really fast. Um, I don't, I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think that a beaver can run 40 miles an hour. Um, I don't know what a beaver's top speed on land is, whatever it is. They only, they can only keep it up for very short bursts. Um, they're definitely not, uh, not sprinters. Uh, they do jump higher than you'd expect though. They have pretty strong spring loaded hind legs. Um, so cool. Any, any, if there, I think we have time for, for, uh, for one more, if there is one, uh, and, uh, otherwise I'll, I'll say, uh, thank you guys so much for, for coming. Thanks again to, uh, Gene and the Cornwall Conservation Trust for organizing. Um, and I uh, hope, hope you guys uh, enjoyed. Thank you, Ben. That was terrific. Thank you all for tuning in tonight. I'm sure that all of us learned some amazing facts about beavers, fur lined lips. Who knew? Um, once the weather cooperates on weekends, we will be planning a hike to one of our beaver ponds on Conservation Trust land, so stay tuned for that. Other than that, have a great weekend. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Ben. <laughs>